Um, yeah, so I have a bit more on lexical uh, semantics uh, in this talk. Uh, it's a talk on perception verbs in Iraq and Gorwa, uh, which are two closely related languages spoken in the Tanzanian Rift Valley, uh, with Iraq being the, the larger language of the two, uh, with a few million, million speakers. And uh, Gorwa has around 100,000 speakers. Um, and they're both South Cushitic languages. So what are perception verbs? Um, perception verbs are verbs that express experience through the senses. Uh, so here we have uh, examples uh, for uh, five of the sensory modalities uh, with our corresponding verbs. So for sight, you have to see, for hearing, you have to hear, et cetera. And you see some examples on the right. And what's important about these examples is that, is that these verbs take uh, a human experiencer as a grammatical subject. So here we have uh, Martin as the experiencer, which is the subject of the verb to see. And the bird, that is uh, the object which is perceived, which we call the phenomenon. So the verb to see takes the experiencer as subject, and that's what we call an experiencer-based verb. Now we also have phenomenon-based verbs, uh, where the phenomenon is the grammatical subject of the sentence. So that's, for example, the verb to sound, as in the bird sounded bad to Felix, where Felix is uh, the experiencer, um, but he is expressed uh, as an oblique. So the bird is the grammatical subject. Now these are experiences, but we also have activities, such as to look, to watch, and to listen to, to touch, to feel, to taste, to smell, to sniff. Um, and these are different from experiences in that these are more controlled. So activities are controlled and atelic, and experiences are not controlled and telic. So telic means that the verbs have an endpoint to them. Um, and these are the two difference with differences between these two types of verbs. So if you take these um, three types, so experiencer-based activities and experiences and phenomenon-based states, then you can uh, organize these in a paradigm with the five sensory modalities um, for each of these event types. Um, this gives you an overview of how the, um, the lexical, lexicalization patterns um, manifest in the language. So, to give a more um, a better overview, you can see that um, for the domains of sight and hearing, the three are distinguished, the three event types. But for touch, taste, and smell, we find the same verb to express all of these three events. So we can say that they are conflated in the same lexical item. Now, let's go on to Iraq and Gorwa. And I have the following research questions. First, how is sensory perception encoded in Iraq and Gora basic verbs? How many sensory modalities are recognized? What are the exact meanings of these verbs? How do the verbs fit into the paradigm? How do Iraq and Gorwa differ in the domain of perception verbs? Do we observe interfield polysemy? That means is the same verb in one domain also used to express another sensory modality. For example, in uh, a language from Ghana, Afatime, we find that the verb for hearing is expressed, um, sorry, expresses also the modalities of taste, touch, smell. Um, and then there's one other perception verb, which is used for sight. So this is what we call interfield polysemy. And then the last question is, what are the typological implications of the findings? Now, I cannot answer all of these questions in the talk, but it's good to keep them in mind. So let's go on to sight. For sight, we find in both languages uh, the verb ar, which means to see. And that's what you can see here in the example sentences. I saw that the church is big. It uses the verb ar. And also in the second example from Gorwa, uh, the verb, the verb ar 
uh, is used to express I saw two people. So we can safely say that this is an experience. But here, the translation says something different. The translation says to look at, um, which is what we would say is an activity in English. Um, but the verb is still to see. So what's going on here? Well, if we go back to our table, we see that um, activities are controlled. And this imperative morphology on the verb to see um, elicits a notion of control, which requires the English translation to adapt and use the activity verb. But we can safely say that um, ar is still an experience um, which takes on a controlled reading if you apply this morphology to it. So the English translation needs to adapt. A neutral context show an experience reading. Now we also have activity verbs uh, in Iraq and Gora. One of them is qaitsit. And uh, this is an intransitive verb. It does not take an object and it needs to look in a direction. So in the first example, you see um, why is he looking this way? What does that boy see? Um, so it takes a locative um, complement. And uh, also in the second example, you see that um, it just says when they looked. Um, so it does not take an object. And in the third example, you also see that it takes a locative complement. Then uh, in this example, the translation suggests an experience, uh, which we see from the English word saw in the translation. But if we look closer, we see that um, this verb does not take an object. So actually, the translation is quite free. Uh, and we should not be fooled by it. And so actually, it works like this. The sentence can be split up into two parts. Uh, she looks in a direction. And then the second clause is, uh, thus, it is a gazelle buck. So she looks, and then she sees it is a gazelle buck. Uh, so we should not interpret this as an experience, but merely um, some some strange English translation that uh, maybe is not quite accurate. Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> um, then we also have the verb gal uh, to look at to watch, uh, and this is an example from Iraq. He is watching the stars. Um, and in Goro, we see I look at the fire. Uh, so this verb does take a direct object. But then we see that it's also translated as to see. And this is something that I cannot explain um, as clearly as the uh, previous example. Um, so for this one, I'm not sure uh, why the two readings are possible. And uh, what, if it's because of a grammatical context that the translation is different or the interpretation is different. Um, or that is just uh, an ambiguous verb. So to summarize the domain of sight, we have Kaitsit and Gao in uh, the activity uh, part. And for experiences, we have Ar and also Gao, but we're not sure about this. And for uh, phenomenon-based verbs, we do not find anything. So uh, no verb that is similar to English, uh, it looks good or it looks bad. Then on to hearing. Um, in Iraq, we find one verb for hearing, which is achas. It means to hear and to listen. And in Goroa, we find two verbs. We have achas, to hear, and a separate verb for to listen, which is achamis. And this last verb um, is derived from achas, as you can see, is derived by a durative suffix, uh, sorry, a durative infix. Um, which adds duration and thus uh, removes the uh, telicity from, uh, from the lexical aspect. And then we arrive at an activity reading. But Iraq also has um, a verb that has the durative infix. 
but this is not um, lexicalized. You do not find it in the dictionaries as, an, as a separate entry, but it is there. So it means to be listening. So if you use this one, you will always arrive at the activity reading of the verb. Now for Iraq, um, you have some examples here of the experience reading. I haven't heard a voice. And do you hear the cows? They are making a noise. Um, so these are the uh, experience readings. And here you have the activity reading. Uh, so they're both possible. Um, and for Gorwa, it's um, the experience reading uh, is expressed by Echas, and the activity reading is expressed with the durative infix. I am listening. So I think I can conclude that the base meaning of this verb is to hear. And I will not analyze um, the derived form as a separate lexical item. I will just assume that uh, the base meaning is to hear and that the activity reading can be derived from it with this durative morphology. So I will put it as a generic experience based verb. And also for uh, phenomenon based verbs, we do not find anything again. So for to touch, we have one verb, quati, um, but there is no verb for to feel. Um, so to touch, quati, is an activity uh, verb. And you can see an example here. Kurmo anu quati taka. Um, a hoe, I won't touch it. But for feeling, it's strange that we do not find anything. So no, nothing in the corpus leads to sentences like um, it feels good or it feels bad or I feel something um, on my skin or I feel the wind, I feel the rain. We do not find anything. So we only have an activity um, verb for uh, the domain of touch. Then on to taste, uh, we find, find uh, um, a cognate verb in, two in the two languages. And uh, just like in English, they can express both activities and experiences. So if you say, hey, this part, taste this part right here, um, then it's an imperative and we can assume an activity reading. Um, but it's also possible to have it as an experience reading, but I do not have an example for that. Um, we also find phenomenon-based verbs. We do find it for this domain. In Iraq, we have uh, chi, to taste bad. Um, and in Gorwa, we have uh, andita, and it, it, I find it in the dictionary as tasting, and it seems to be derived from the verb to see, ar. Um, there's only one example of this. The milk was tasted, um, but I'm not sure about the uh, derivation of this verb, but it does very clearly seem to be derived from to see. And this would be either an experience or an activity. I cannot notice from the translation. So on to smell. In Goro, we have the verb tsa. Um, as we can see here in the example. And I found one context where you can interpret it as an experience and one context, the one below, where you can interpret it as an activity. Uh, so the old man sneezed when he smelled the flower. Um, that's when he like literally sniffs the flower and then you will sneeze. It's not when you smell flowers without knowing. Uh, so, uh, that's both activity and experience. And for Iraq, um, we also find uh, phenomenon-based verbs. Uh, in Iraq, we find tsutsu, to smell bad. And in Goro, we find tli. Um, and do note that this verb in Gorwa uh, corresponded, it, it's the same uh, verb as the one we find in Iraq for to taste bad. So in Gorwa, it has a different meaning. Um, but it is still a phenomenon-based verb. So here is an example, the food smells bad, uh, which uses this phenomenon-based verb, with the food being the grammatical subject of the sentence. 
So to conclude, we have this final paradigm. Um, so let's summarize it again. For a site, we find um, a verb for the experience, which is ar uh, to see, kaitzit uh, for to look, which is intransitive. Gaal uh, was a transitive verb, but it could also mean to see. We did not find phenomenon-based verbs for uh, the domains of sight, hearing, and touch. For hearing, we had ahas, uh, which is a generic uh, auditory verb. Um, but there was the durative infix, which uh, often derives the activity reading. For touch, we only find an activity verb, um, but no verb for to feel. And for taste, we have uh, two verbs, uh, two very similar ones uh, for Goro and Iraq. Um, and there is the verb in Goro that is derived from uh, ar to see. And for smell, we find uh, one generic experience or based verb, but also uh, verbs for uh, phenomenon based perception. Um, so back to the research questions, we observed how sensory perception is encoded in Iraq and Gora basic verbs. We know uh, that five sensory modalities are recognized. Um, unlike other languages where maybe only two are recognized or some languages recognize even more than five. Um, what are the exact meanings of these verbs? Well, we uh, distinguish between uh, activities, experiences, and uh, even more in the case of Kaitzit, it's uh, intransitive. How do Iraq and Gorba differ in the domain of perception verbs? Well, actually, they're very similar, but they differ um, in, uh, in that Iraq has a phenomenon based verb for to taste, uh, whereas Gorwa does not have that. Um, and do we observe interfield polysemy? Yes, we do. Uh, we found an extension from sight to taste in Gorwa with the verb andin. And what are the typological implications of the findings? Um, they're actually very consistent with everything that has been found before, um, except that maybe we don't find phenomenon-based verbs for uh, sight and hearing. This is something to look into and see if this is common across languages, uh, because most languages that have been described, uh, I think, do have phenomenon-based verbs for, uh, for all of the senses. Um, yeah, so that's my conclusion, and here are some references. And I'll keep the slides under research questions or on the paradigm. Um, to uh, yeah, so you can uh, ruminate over this uh, this paradigm and uh, maybe come up with some questions for me. Thank you. I think that that's a great idea, Jeroen. Thank you for this uh, brilliant presentation. Probably making Martin and I sweat over our free translations or how we've defined things in the dictionary. I'm, uh, I'm sure that I did. I'm looking at Martin and his square here and I can see a sheepish <laughs> grin as well. So I expect that he's feeling quite the same as me. Martin, your hand is up. I'll let you, uh, I'll let you uh, have a first say. Uh, yes, oh, I'm, I'm still unmuted. Um, yes, uh, in, in, indeed, and Andrew is, uh, but let me first uh, raise this quartet uh, to touch. Um, I wonder whether it's, uh, yeah, what it really means, whether it's, it's a sense. Um, so why would it be a sense if it would just mean to poke your finger? Um, yes, that's a very good question. Um, I talked about this with Andrew and we arrived at the conclusion that to touch is not really, um, something of uh like it's not perception it entails it can entail perception so when you touch something that may lead to you feeling something but it doesn't have to um 
it indeed just describes the activity of of putting your finger onto something um but it's still um it's still something to look at uh, because the verbs for touch um can uh, manifest in other domains of uh of the sensory paradigm uh, so for some languages we do find that uh, the verb for to touch um also is used to express other modalities yeah but um yeah no my reaction would be but here it's not and then it would be i would say this i would look at uh, at maybe those those other senses uh, you have a you you have a verb to feel dizzy you have a verb a specific verb to feel proud um, yes yeah, so those are very specific uh meanings and there is, seems to be no general uh verb for feeling um yeah but is is feeling dizzy a feeling or is it another sense yeah that's difficult because in english you do use the word feel to express this but yeah it, it can also be um just like saying um like i am sick like you can also say to feel sick and um yeah like why would it be necessary to express the uh the, the feeling part if you can express the uh just the state how it is uh without talking about the feeling yeah i think you also should come to the field and feel and uh, and and yeah it's um it is i think it's very interesting if you if for this kind of semantic research if you if you go if you manage to to think from within within the language and uh, but yeah, but, uh, yeah I, uh, very nice overview. I forgot to start with that. And I have a question to, maybe it's to Andrew with this, and what was it, and to? Andine. Andine. To taste. Because I don't have that in Iraq with, not as a verb, but as a chiefly andu. Uh, it is used in the, in a, in a poem. Oh, um, and it, it would be sweet. Okay. So I was wondering for Gorwa, is it is it a productive verb? That's a good question. Yeah, I uh, I'd have to remember where I got it. Um, I don't know if it's in if it's in a sentence or if it was sort of a lexical form that I was given. Uh, I'd have to look. And can you listen again to it? Um, yeah, either you or... Uh, but because it has a fringe, initial pharyngeal in, in Iraq. Ah, so... And then, and then, it, and then it wouldn't be the same, it wouldn't be from to see. Yeah, it possibly wouldn't be. That's interesting. So yeah, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to do that and listen for the pharyngeal. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's great. That's a great extra point. Yeah. Um, I will say, uh, I will say uh, something recently that I uh, I found. I have not for Gorba, but for Iraq, Martin. Mm. I uh, I'd spent several days uh, without showering, and uh, I went to my motorcycle repair shop and uh, to get some to get some tune-ups done. And the guy in the back, uh, I went to pay him. And uh, he said to his friend who's speaking in Iraq at this time, I was in Haidom, so I, I expect that he, that he was an Iraq speaker, not a Gorwa speaker. Uh, he looked at his friend uh, and he said, uh, he said in, in Iraq, I expect, he said, this, you know, he said, this white man is really traveled. He smells really bad. And he used tleep, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. So I think- oh, it, was, that, uh, it was in Iraq, so- yeah, I would I would expect that maybe what you have is is some polysemy, but of course that's just anecdotal. So uh, maybe don't put that in. Maybe add that as an interesting footnote. Yeah. Um, but I see that Felix has had his hand up for quite some time. So um, why don't we uh, move to Felix? Felix, uh, feel free. Yes. Thank you all for this exciting afternoon and uh, very 
provocative and uh, stimulating talks. And thank you, Yarun, uh, for this. So actually, I'm going to continue a little bit on the kind of question that Martin raised. So indeed, touch is an activity, OK? And when you touch something, you experience something. And what you experience is that feel. And that feel is an experience. It's, it, it, it causes you some sensation. So you were saying, oh, when he said there were verbs like to feel dizzy, and then you had all these other questions. To feel dizzy is a sense, uh, dizziness is a sensation. So it, it is a sense uh, thing. So if you have verbs like that, because I was curious when you had that question mark with the feel, because you know yourself, there is also this proprioceptive feel, right? Yes. And, and I think that, that there, should, there, there should be things there that you need to, so to feel dizzy, to feel cold. Yeah, you were, you see the English language is, is a, 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 a I don't want to use the word. <laughs> it's a <laughs> difficult language for us because it's 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 misguiding us. You know, mm. it is yeah. true. You can say I feel sick versus I am sick, and yes. there is a semantic difference, and it does relate to whether it is a state or it is a kind of sensation that you are feeling. Yeah. So, so the semantics of the verb feel plays that role. Yeah. So uh, for the audience to explain a little bit, uh, Felix said. Um, feel can also be proprioceptive. And that means um, that feeling is not only feeling um, externally, but also internally. So you can feel feelings, sensations inside of your body. Uh, you can feel uh, dizzy, sick. Uh, you can feel uh, heat and cold. And that is different in some languages from uh, feeling uh, a rough surface or feeling uh, a fluffy, uh, fluffy thing. So yeah. um, English does not distinguish between, between these two um, types of feeling. Um, so arguably, there are six senses with uh, proprioception uh, being the sixth next to touch. But English conflates these in a verb to feel. Good. So then you shouldn't be having question marks for feel for these languages. So the next thing, actually, I wish <laughs> Martin didn't say there was a pharyngeal in the Andean because I, I, I wanted to know more about how you would say that is a derivation from the R. Mm -hmm. And it would be good for me if it was, which would make me question something you said at the beginning with avatime. Yeah. So, in avatime, you do use the verb see together with, and this is something that people miss, together with an activity verb, okay, to express taste. It's the same thing that you do with smell also. In other words, you have your C verb. No, no, it's not the C verb that you use, it's the here, here verb. It's here the here in avatime. Verb. Yeah, it's the here yeah. verb that you use. You have the here verb giving you the experience part of the thing. So how do you taste things? You put the thing somewhere. And then you yeah. have this activity verb expressing that, putting the thing somewhere. And then you feel something, you, which, is the, which is actually the verb you also use for the feel in proprioception. So when yeah. you feel cold and so on. So yeah. there, uh, uh, to say that they, it conflates, it conflates uh, hearing and uh, taste is not accurate. Yeah. And this is something that people say every time and we need to you know, break that. So it would have been nice if Andine was derived from that. And then I would say, and, and, and that has consequences for your further analysis. I don't know yeah. why you don't want to put the derivative activity of, of the hearing the where you say there is a, a derivation of the ahas. I yeah. mean, it is a derived lexical item. So if you want to really represent it, then it's an activity yes. derived from the experience. And that pattern we do get, and it will help us in understanding this. Yeah. Anyway. Um, 
Yeah, so for what you said about um, like a verb from another modality combining with uh, a noun like taste or smell to express the meaning uh, to taste or to smell. No, but, um, but that's different for the avatime. Eh? It's not a, a noun, it's the verb. So oh, it's, it's the verb. a verb which talks about something like putting something somewhere and then this feel, experience, hear, verb. Together, that's what says taste. Yeah. 